are starting a brand new series today, and so at all of our sites uh, in Clovis, New Mexico, Servants Heart Chapel, and here in Oklahoma City, would you join me in a round of applause just welcoming your brothers and sisters in the Lord today and uh, telling them that you are so glad that they are here. And uh, so thank you for, uh, for sharing uh, this part of your day with us. We are starting a brand new series today in the book of Colossians. Uh, but uh, a lot of these, these New Testament books, they're short letters and things like that that were written uh, by different people to churches and to people that, who are Christians in a particular city or region. And so if you don't know the background of why a letter was written, sometimes it doesn't mean as much. And so today what we're really taking the time to do is dig into the background of this letter and say, why is this written? What's the story? Where do these people come from? Have you ever noticed that if you know somebody's story, you understand them better? If you know their story, if I know your story, I get to know you better. You know my story. You start to get a feel for who I am and why I'm so weird, right? Uh, so that's kind of where we're at today uh, is we're going to look, look into the background of what happened uh, before this letter called Colossians was written. And so we're going we're gonna to launch into that today. Uh, Paul is the person who wrote this book, the Apostle Paul, famous guy. Uh, you may not know his story. Let me tell you quickly where he came from. Paul was raised a Jew, and he was very passionate about his religion. And uh, gradually, as he grew up, he felt like that the most important thing he could do for God was to kill these people who were Christians, who were believers in Jesus, those who followed what they called back in those days the way. And uh, they, he, he said, I, I feel like the most important thing I could do to fight for God somehow is, uh, is to kill these people who were followers of Jesus. And so he was a Christian killer. That's who Paul was. And so he, he, as he goes along in his life, he is uh, putting Christians to death. He's approving of others when they put them to death. He is uh, bursting into homes, dragging people off to jail, uh, imprisoning them. The Scripture says he was making havoc of the church. But something happened one day as Paul was on his way to a city called Damascus to put Christians in prison there. He had letters giving him authorization to put the Christians there in prison, and something happened. Jesus Christ knocked Paul off of his donkey, knocks him on his can in the middle of the road on the way to Damascus, on the way to kill Christians, and Jesus utterly changed his life. So when he does, Paul is revolutionized, and he becomes the greatest missionary of all time. He is traveling around the ancient world, around the known world, spreading the gospel, planting churches, powerful, powerful man of God. How do you explain somebody who so radically changes? Well, wherever he goes, people are amazed at his story, amazed at what has happened in his life and what Jesus has done, and God uses him to be transform the ancient world. Paul is very strategic, and he goes to cities. He goes to places where people gather. In fact, uh, the places that he goes, one of them is a place called Ephesus. Uh, it's in modern-day Turkey. And uh, it's, it's just a, a, a fantastic, fantastic city that uh, Paul goes to. So he goes to uh, a city in, uh, called Ephesus. It's a very wealthy place. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's incredibly well-educated and wealthy. In fact, uh, so you'll notice some of the, uh, some of the things here, the, the pictures that I have from ancient Ephesus. Uh, this is actually a portion of a library uh, that, uh, that was just, uh, just uh, beautiful. I mean, you can tell... For back in the ancient world, that would have been a fantastic, fantastic building, uh, that what's left of it there in, in Ephesus. And then here's a picture of uh, the, uh, the road uh, that goes down, uh, down one of the main roads of, of the old city of Ephesus. And just a tremendous, tremendous place of wealth. You notice the white stone there and the columns, and it just would have been a beautiful, beautiful place to visit. Part of the reason it was so wealthy was that it was a port city. All the major roads uh, in that area went through Ephesus. So it was kind of like it was a crossroads. All the places around there, if you wanted to go sell your stuff from your farm or from your herd of sheep and you wanted to sell your wool or you were a weaver of cloth and you wanted to sell it, you would go to Ephesus because that's the place where you went. It was also a port city right on the, uh, the uh, port of uh, where it opened out into the ocean where people would trade back and forth from uh, Rome and, and places like that. All around the world uh, would sail through Ephesus and they would stop and trade there. 
So it was a very, very wealthy city. In fact, uh, you'll, you'll notice this right here. This is a, a, a very delicately carved entrance to a, a pagan temple. It was a very spiritual uh, place, kind of a, a center of spirituality and magic and worship, uh, idol worship, not worship of the living God, but idol worship. In fact, at least 50 gods and goddesses that we know of were worshipped in Ephesus. Uh, that was uh, The most popular was, was Artemis uh, or Diana. You'll see that name pop up again in the story this morning. Uh, but uh, just a, a very pagan and wicked place. Uh, there, were, uh, there were just lots of wicked things that went on in the name of worship in Ephesus. But it was a place where it was very spiritual. Not that much different in some ways than the culture where we live. America, Oklahoma City, even Clovis are sometimes crossroads of cultures where, whether it's Cannon Air Force Base or I-40 and I-35 and I-44 that all run through Oklahoma City, there's places where people gather and people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, they come together and those are strategic places because people come there and then they leave. And that's exactly what happens with this book of Colossians that we're about to study. It's written to a, to a city that's not a big city. It's not a big, huge place. But it was something that, that it was a, a city about 100 miles away from Ephesus, again, in present-day Turkey. And about 100 miles away, there's this little town called Colossae. And uh, as, as Paul is, is working in Ephesians, or working in Ephesus rather, uh, we start seeing the story start to come together. Uh, Epaphras is a guy from Colossae. He comes to Ephesus, apparently gets saved under Paul's ministry. Uh, God convicts him of his sin. He repents, believes in Jesus, and he is so moved by what he learns there and what he has experienced there that he says, man, they need this back where I come from. And so, sure enough, he heads back to Colossae. After his time in Ephesus is done, he heads back to Colossae, and God takes the, the message of the gospel back with him, and Jesus starts changing lives, and a church is planted in Colossae. Fantastic, fantastic story. Today, we're going to look into exactly how that all breaks down, and how that works out, right? So, we're going to start in Acts chapter 19, the story of Christianity coming into of Jesus breaking into Ephesus and Colossae is a story of, if you're taking notes, it's on your handout, number one, theologically, theologically confused people. Acts chapter 19 is where we break in here where it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, and there he found some disciples, some Christians. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That can be translated after you believed, and they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Okay, so these guys are, are kind of confused theologically. Paul said, so what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied, and Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So you understand, John the Baptist was this guy who went before Jesus, and he said, repent, turn from your sins, get your heart ready, because the Messiah, Jesus, the King, is coming. The kingdom of heaven is on its way. Get ready, repent of your sins. And he would baptize people who were repentant for their, uh, of their sins and were turning away from their sins. And so the problem is apparently these guys had done that, but then they never heard that the, the Messiah actually did come. He actually did come. Jesus had come. He lived. He died. He rose again. And these guys hadn't heard. And so they've just received John's baptism. And so on hearing this, verse 5, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, I've got to stop and kind of deal with that because that's something that sometimes is misunderstood uh, in our culture. People are kind of freaking out like, oh, what is this that, you know, People are on, on my TV whacking people on the head and they're falling down and saying things. that. And so uh, it's, it's a little confusing sometimes in our modern world uh, with all the kind of weird spiritual stuff that sometimes goes on in the name of Jesus on your TV or maybe in your local town or local church there. So i got to explain that. Basically, in the, in the Scripture, whenever the, the gift of tongues is spoken of in, in the book of Acts, here's what's going on. Uh, it is a real language, real languages, 
of real people and real countries given for the preaching of the gospel and the communication of God's word. And uh, the way we know this is in Acts chapter 2 when it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them ability. If you look at it later on, it says, and everyone heard in the language that they were born in. They said, how are these guys doing this? They were amazed by this miracle that all these men could speak these languages, all these different languages of all these nationalities that were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, where it was kind of a multicultural center, lots of different languages, lots of different people groups all coming together in one city. In Acts chapter 8, you have the same thing happening, people being filled with the Holy Spirit, but now they're in a little town in Samaria. It's not a major multicultural center, and there's nothing spoken about speaking in tongues. Why? It wasn't needed. Nobody, there was, everybody spoke the same language. Later on, you get here in Acts chapter 19, they're in Ephesus, major multicultural center, lots of sailors coming through, lots of travelers coming through, lots of different languages, people groups. And guess what happens? They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit gives them the ability to speak in these other languages for the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Amazing thing. So it's not some gibberish unknown language that's being spoken of here. They were speaking in real languages and preaching, prophesying the good news about Jesus, and there were about 12 men in all. Now I would stop and say this, not that much different than our day. There's a lot of theologically confused people. Have you met some of these people that, that, that they're like, uh, I don't know, I, I, just, uh, I just don't know, I've always thought of God like this, or I've always thought of God like that, and everybody's got their own idea of God, and so you've got, when you say God, people are like, which one? Which, what, what, what God? What's he like? What, is this the God that, that George Lucas is paint, painting in Star Wars, you know, a, kind of a, a nondescript force that's in everything, or is this... The, the creator, God, the person that loves and cares for you. Theologically confused people. We have to bring the truth to people. They're not suddenly usually going to just come up with it on their own. You and I are carriers of the truth of God's word. We are carriers of the truth of the gospel. And so just like God did this in Ephesus, as people that you find theologically confused people, we find the same thing today. The, the other day I had a friend that was talking to uh, someone, and his friend started just mouthing off about, ah, oh, God's like this and God's like that. And he said he was saying some really, really messed up stuff. And he said, uh, well, man, that's not, the, that's not what I read in the Bible. I, I, I don't see God like that at all. And the guy said, well, what version of the Bible do you read? And he said, well, and he named a, a version that he was most familiar with. And he, the guy said, oh, well, see, there's your problem. He said, I read the HIV version. <laughs> said, oh, okay, now I see where the problem is. HIV, no, we don't, yeah, that's not a version of the Bible. We don't do that uh, around here. And uh, so, at any rate, we, uh, we see theologically confused people, maybe some of them in your own neighborhood, in your own home even. And we need to bring them the truth. So as we look on through the rest of the story, we see that we find some theologically confused people, but they're in a, number two on your handout, in a strategically important city. In a strategically important city. So Paul enters the synagogue, verse 8, and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. And they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Now, let me stop and say this. You ever notice that sometimes when you bring the truth to someone and you argue with them, it doesn't change them? Have you ever noticed that? Romans chapter 1 says that men suppress the truth in their ungodliness. In other words, sometimes they don't hear it and don't understand it because they don't want to hear it, and they don't want to understand it. The attitude of the heart plays a lot of difference in that, and anybody who's ever dealt with a teenager or a child, you know that's true. Like, they don't always get it because they don't want to get it. And you know what? Honestly, I've got to admit that we're not that much different as adults, you and I. It's not that much different, is it? Honestly, the truth is that all of us have our issues with that. And so, so that's what happened with Paul. He comes and he tries to preach, but some of these people, they don't want to hear. They don't want to know. And so they become obstinate and they start speaking lies and, and false things about these Christians. So Paul left them. 
and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years. Get this, this is a very important phrase. This went on for two years so that all the Greeks and Jews who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All the Jews and Greeks who lived in that province, they all heard the word of the Lord. So God is talking. God is speaking. God is doing things. And as people come through Ephesus, they hear the word of the Lord and go back home. And before long, Paul has been so strategic and so mightily, powerfully used of God that the whole region has heard about what he's teaching. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Isn't it cool to think that that people come and they're with you for a season, but if you're speaking the truth and you're talking Jesus to them, then when they leave after a while, you've touched a whole lot more people than just in your neighborhood and on your street. And I want to commend you, uh, both here and in Clovis, for the work that you're doing in helping people and touching lives. And man, because you're, you're making an influence. You're having an influence. You're making a difference. You're touching people with, for Jesus and Man, it, it, it makes a difference so that after a while the word spreads. Those people are different. That guy's teaching some interesting stuff over there. They're, they're not the same as you usually think about. Make a difference. We're about to see something a little bit different uh, in this, this next part of the story. It's going to be really fascinating. So I want to give you some background by doing this right here. In this, this uh, picture right here is a picture of the temple, a model really, a a model of what it might have looked like at the temple of Artemis or Diana. This is a a very interesting thing about Ephesus. This was a powerfully, amazingly, gloriously built temple. In fact, one of the ancient writers in Rome uh, said, I have traveled all over the world. I've traveled all over the Roman Empire and I've seen this and I've seen that. But when I saw this building, he said, I said, the sun has never set on anything more beautiful than this. So uh, fabulous, awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping. The problem is it wasn't for the worship of God, the true and living God. It was for the worship of a false god, an an idol, a goddess named Artemis or Diana. So I I want you to look at this with me, and I want you to think about this. The truth is that, that, that Paul is ministering in a very multicultural, spiritual society. That, that they, they care about their goddess so much they would build something like this in her honor. Clearly, sincere uh, people who are very spiritual in their pursuits. Not that much different, not that much different than our day. But I want you to work with me, work with me through this. Look at, at number, number three on your handout, because these were theologically confused people in a strategically important city who were bound by Satan. I want you to look at verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Let me first deal with that. This is a descriptive of what Paul did, not prescriptive, so you need to do it too, okay? But Paul was so powerfully, powerfully used by God. People are coming to him from everywhere, and he's preaching the gospel and teaching, and there are so many people that desire to be healed, so many people that need to be delivered, that he is, he is just not able to make all the appointments. He simply can't go. And so he says, look, uh, you take this handkerchief or you take this apron and you take it to them and their sickness will be cured. Wow, God was moving so powerfully. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a lot of time for the guys who do this on the TV uh, because they're usually, you know, send in your donation and I'll send you a hanky that I've prayed over, you know, and I'm not really that impressed with that, all honesty. A lot of those things are just guys making money in the name of Jesus. But this is stuff where Paul's saying, look, I can't, I don't have time to go, but if you'll take this, it'll take care of your problem. Wow. God was moving amazingly. And I want you to notice something in the last phrase. Would you underline this on your handout? And the evil spirits left them. Let's, let's read that one more time, and let's read it at all of our sites together, okay? And the evil spirits left them. 
Now you say, what is, what is that about? It looks like a sickness and, and, and evil spirits. I don't, I don't understand how that's all fitting together here. Well, the truth is that not all physical sicknesses are physical. There is an overlap between the body and the spirit. There's an overlap between the body and the mind. You know this is true, right? Because you've met people that if, you, if they think they're sick long enough, they'll get sick. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen this where people, they think they're sick, and after a while, they'll actually get sick. It's like they make themselves sick by thinking about it up here. And it's, a, it's actually a measurable, actual thing that you can see happen. Most of us have seen it at one time or another. And so there's this overlap between the physical part of us and the other parts of our, of our being, our, our mind and our spirit. And so as Paul is ministering, he is, he is seeing that there's an overlap that is the spiritual world is affecting the physical. And I want to tell you this, that the spiritualism around us in our world is a very challenging and honestly kind of dangerous, a very dangerous thing. Because in the Scripture, we see a different picture than the way spiritualism is presented in our culture. How many of you have heard of, of the, spiritual, the spiritual fascination kind of that's going on with supernatural fascination, spiritual fascination of things that are in our culture? It's very common. Uh, in fact, if you go in a bookstore, if there's a Barnes & Noble or something around, you go in a bookstore and they'll have a big old section on Eastern mysticism and on uh, spiritualism and on Wicca and all these kinds of things. If you go in a movie theater or you look at a movie theater chart, you will see the, the upcoming movies. You'll see things like uh, over the last few years, the Harry Potter movies, uh, the Twilight movies, Edward and Bella, you know, and, and, and vampires and werewolves and, and uh, all of these very interesting fascinations that our culture has. You will see uh, TV shows like uh, Bewitched and, and uh, Supernatural and movies that are, that are about uh, kids with supernatural powers and very interesting, very interesting. You know, the only problem is this, that in all of those situations, spiritualistic things are presented as tools to be manipulated. They're presented as, you know, sometimes there's a dark side, this evil, selfish person, and then there's a white side, white magic. It's good magic, and it's, you know, spells to help your boyfriend like you, and, and this is the way it's presented. You can use your great power for magic to do good, or you can use it to do evil, and it's all about what you do with it. But the truth is that in the Scripture, here's the picture that's presented. I want you to hear this. Here's the picture that's presented of spiritual reality, and that is this. There is God, and there's everything else. There is God's power, and there is everything else. Now that's a vastly different picture, isn't it, from, from what is, is being presented in our culture. It's, it's not God and praying to Him and trusting in Him and living a godly life and seeing His power and His glory. Instead, it's, it's a picture of you have great power in the spiritual world and you can move things with your mind and you can run super fast and you can live forever without God, isn't it? And without prayer, and, and the glory goes to the person with the power, not to the, the God who brought it to pass. And so let me tell you what I'm seeing as a pastor. As a pastor, here's what I'm seeing. I am seeing a rise in spiritual related problems that I encounter. I have, I have seen things that that I'm seeing more and more of a rise in people under the bondage of Satan. As our culture gets more and more and more fascinated with these things and more and more and more kids grow up thinking that it is normal to be interested, involved in witches and witchcraft and Wicca and spiritual mysticism and ancestral worship and, and contacting uh, spirits and things like that, the more of this we, th that we see rising along with it is rising some really, really twisted, messed up stuff. It was not that long ago that I was called to a, a friend's house, uh, not somebody who attends here, 
but I was called to a, a friend's house, and a young man that uh, was just a teenager, very mild-mannered, very easygoing. Um, I was called to his house, and they called me and said, hey, he's, he's tearing up the house and throwing things and screaming and breaking things. And I rushed to his house, and I, I came to, into the room where he was, and he was kicking and breaking, and, and I, his mother was practically sitting on top of him uh, to, to try to hold him down. And I, I grabbed hold of him, and I called him by name, and I said, stop this, stop this, Jesus loves you. And he looked up at me, and you have to understand this was not him. This is not who he was at all. He looked up at me with this look in his eye, and he said, well, I guess he, I, I sure wish he was alive then. And it just kind of went all over me like, oh, oh, we're dealing with a spiritual something here that wants to deny the resurrection of our Lord Jesus that says he's not alive. That's not this kid. And I spoke to him, or to rather to it that was behind this all, and I said, be silent. You will not say that again. You know that Jesus is alive and you are defeated. And I said, I'm going to pray over you right now. And I began to pray and praise the name of Jesus and praise him for his, his awesome power. And in a couple of minutes, the, the boy relaxed and began to cry and didn't remember part of what had happened and, and just... Now, I don't, I don't say that to exalt me or to scare you or anything else. I, I, I share that to tell you the point of this series, and that is this. Even though the devil is strong, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. He is greater in power. He is more awesome in wonder than anything else and anyone else. There is no one who is like our Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul found so many years ago in the city of Ephesus. You say, when you see this false worship of these false gods, and there's all these people bound by Satan, and he's even making them ill, what in the world you look at this and you say, what in the world? How can anybody change this? How can anybody? Jesus can. He's that big. He's that good. He's that awesome. Jesus is greater. And I don't care what your background is or what you're coming out of or what you felt. The other day I sat in a guy's house and he said, I, he, said he was describing a, a spiritual event in his life. He's not a believer, but he was saying, you know, I, I felt this moment where I felt uh, I felt like, like there was something pressing down on me and I couldn't speak and I couldn't scream and it was, it was just scary. He said, I don't know what to think about it. You know what? It scared him and he, he cleaned up and got off drugs and he's moving toward the Lord. He's not there yet, but I got great hopes for the guy. He's moving the right direction because he wants to be free from that and be, and, and be delivered by Jesus, be transformed by Jesus. You know what? Jesus can do that. And I don't know what your background is. I don't know where you come from or what your situation is. I have no idea what God would want to do right now or what he'd need to do in your life to deliver you and break the power of sin and break the bondage that you're under, break the habits that you've never been able to shake off. I don't know, but I can promise you this without any question. Jesus is greater than whatever is holding you down. Jesus is greater than every chain and every habit and every sin that has ever bound you. Jesus is greater. You see, <laughs> this next story is really going to illustrate this. It, it illustrates the futility of spiritualism versus Jesus. I want you to look at this. Some uh, Jews, this is one of the funniest stories in the Bible to me. Well, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, in verse 13, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish high priest, a chief priest, were doing this. And one day, the evil spirit answers them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. And he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, that's just funny. Now, I, the poor guys. 
But they're fooling around with stuff without the power of Jesus. They're fooling around with spiritual realities without the power of Jesus behind them. That is a grave, grave mistake. That's a huge issue. Wow. Don't, you, know, you see, if you're taking notes, it's on your handout. Satan is not afraid of spirituality. He is afraid of Jesus. You can't get this generic, uh, over-the-counter brand spirituality and it's going to protect you. I, I just want to be honest with you. You look around and you see uh, stuff like, uh, well, I, I need this cross because it's my good luck charm. These guys were using Jesus like a good luck charm. I need this cross, I'm, I hang it from my mirror because then I, I, I'm protected. Let me just tell you something. The truth is that a cross hanging from your rear view will not protect you. It's useless. It's useless. Okay, well, the Virgin Mary, I've got to have this statue in my yard, or I've got to have this... Uh, you know what? Let me just be honest with you. Virgin Mary, to protect you, is useless. You see, it's the person who died on the cross that you need. You see, it's the person that the Virgin Mary gave birth to that you need. Satan is not afraid of symbols or spirituality. He is afraid of the presence of the very real Lord Jesus in your life. That is what makes you powerful enough to be victorious over him. And these guys, they knew the name, but they didn't have the person. They tried the, the, the magic potion. They tried the charm but it didn't work because they didn't have Jesus. They didn't have the one behind it. And so, uh, you guarantee, I guarantee you that this, this shook everybody up, honestly. Uh, let me just tell you a story. I had a pastor friend uh, that was, was telling this story. He said he had a, a lady that he met who sat beside on a plane or something, and she, she had written a book of prayers. Well, how wonderful, right? She wrote a book of prayers. That's just beautiful and touching and sweet. And he said this, he said, uh, so who is it that you pray to? And she said, oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You can't. That's not the way it works. That's like, that's like oh, my child is sick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pick up and call a random phone number. I'm going to say, hey, um, man, my kid is sick. Do you think you can help and, 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 and heal her? You think you could do that for me, please? You know what? You need to call 911. That's what you need to call. And then you need to call and pray and talk to Jesus. You wouldn't call a random number if you need a doctor and ask advice. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't call a random number and ask for investing advice. You want to call the right number because you want to know you're talking to the right person because it's not a generic, vague sort of spirituality. It's Jesus, my friend. It's Jesus. That's what you need. So check this out. Number four, if you're taking notes, these people are totally changed by Jesus. These spirit people who have been bound by Satan are totally changed by Jesus. Look at verse 17. When all this became known to the Jews, Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet you they were. One dude who's demon-possessed, beats up seven guys, and they run screaming and naked through the streets. That's going to get around. Uh, it's, it's definitely going to get around. But somebody's going to hear about that. That's going to show up on the news. They're going to be talking about that around the water cooler the next day. Seven guys running naked through the streets, screaming and bloody. And they were all seized with fear. They were like, oh, this is different. This Jesus thing, this is different. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. In other words, there were some people who had kind of, they were hanging around and they kind of believed, but all of a sudden they realized this is a big deal. This is a very big deal. This is not something to play around with. This is not all my other gods plus Jesus. This is Jesus and he's in a whole different category than all my other spirituality. This is Jesus plus nothing. And so, look at this, they now came and openly confessed their evil deeds, and a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Now, I, I just let me, let me put that in perspective for you. I want you to look at this. This is a, a picture of a drachma, in case you've never seen uh, that, uh, that, that 
picture right there is a, a drachma. You say, what is a, what is a drachma? Well, it's a, it was a coin, a daily wage coin that they used back in, in the, these days. And so it was basically worth a, a daily wage for a skilled worker. You were a stone carver. You were a uh, sew, uh, seamstress uh, that sewed clothing or something like that. Uh, you do your work. End of the day, they pay you a drachma. And the, the uh, ancient records say, some, one, one writer said in the, back in the ancient times that someone could live comfortably on one drachma a day. So this is a decent wage. It's like a living wage. Maybe, I don't know, what, 10 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, something like that. It depends on what part of the country you're in and what level of society you're in, I know. But let's just assume it's 10 bucks an hour for the sake of this illustration. If you figure that a drachma was a daily wage at 10 bucks an hour, and you multiply this out to figure up 50,000 daily wages, here's what you come up with. Somewhere in the area of 4 to $5 million dollars. This is an insane amount of money. All of a sudden, these people are bringing their, their stuff with them, and they're saying, Here, here's all these books and these parchments and these spell books and these magic books, very old, very valuable. Here, burn them. Burn them. Let's get rid of this. 50,000 50, drachmas, four to five million bucks worth of stuff. Man, Jesus is doing a big work in Ephesus. He is doing amazing things. Now, I want to, I want to stop and just, just notice something. If you believe in Jesus, it has to impact your actual life. Your actual, the way you live your life. It has to actually impact that. In fact, it will impact that if you believe. If you truly believe in Jesus. I meet people all the time who say they believe in Jesus. Well, yeah, you believe He existed, but you don't believe Him. You don't, haven't, it's not affecting your life. It's not impacting your life. But these people really believed. They were, they were saying, you know what? I'm cutting ties with the old life. Every time in Scripture it is depicted as turning to Jesus, you're turning away from sin. Did you know this? Every time in Scripture it's talking about turning away from sin, it's talking about turning to Jesus. Turning away from sin and turning to Jesus every time. It's not like, now, here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that some of you believe in Jesus, but it's more like you, you, you want to believe, but you're more like looking over your shoulder at Jesus. You're not turning from sin and turning to Jesus. It's more like looking over your shoulder and thinking how nice that is. Like, oh, that's really great. It's Jesus. He seems like a nice guy, a good teacher. I kind of like what he talks about, loving one another and these sorts of things. But you're not turning away from sin. And I would ask you, if you will not turn away from the old life and you will not turn away from the sins that nailed Jesus to the cross, do you really believe in him at all? I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that there's some people right here today. I'm going to say there's some people right now listening to this message that need to deal with some stuff in your life. You need to make a trip back to your house, and something is coming to mind right now. And you need to go into the back of that bureau drawer, and you need to pull out what's in there, and you need to get rid of it, because it's, it's a tie to the old life. It's, a, it, it's sinful and it's wrong, and you know it's wrong, but you're hanging on to it for some reason. You're afraid to let go of it. My friends, the sacrifice is worth it. Let me just, let's just admit something together, that if you were one of these people and you were bringing a huge, valuable collection of books, you were bringing a valuable collection of books to, to burn publicly, and you had five million bucks worth of books or you're one of these people and you got a half million or a million dollars worth of, of evil stuff in your garage, you'd be sorely tempted to sell it and go follow Jesus. Am I right? Right? Like, man, I tell you what, I'm going to get rid of this and sell it to some people who don't know Jesus, and then I'm going to go follow Jesus. And that's not what they do. It's not what they do. You know why? They were willing to sacrifice like this because what they had found was so satisfying. What they had found, they realized this Jesus is not like this other stuff. He's not. It's, it's him or nothing. It's not my spirituality plus Jesus. Jesus is greater. He is bigger. He is more awesome. He's totally in his own category. 
They were like, this is, good. This is the way it's got to happen. Four to five million dollars? Oh, worth it. Why? Because Jesus is greater. And some of you are afraid. You are sitting there right now, this day, and you are afraid and thinking, I don't know if I can do that, man. I don't know, like, like I might, I can't, I can't give up that. I can't give up that. I'm, I, I can't live without it. That boyfriend, that girlfriend, if I, if I follow Jesus, they'll leave me. You know what? They might. It's worth it. Jesus is greater. You say, well, that my family, they, if, I, if I really sell out and follow Jesus, they won't, they won't accept me. They won't. You know what? Jesus is greater. It's worth it. It's worth it. You say, well, oh, man, I just don't know. I don't know if I can do this because if, if, if I do, I'll lose my job. You might. You might. You know what? Jesus is greater. It's worth it. You say, well, I don't know if I can... If I can do that, Daryl, because I've never lived very long without those drugs or without that drink or without that, I don't know if I can. You know what? Give it to Jesus. He's greater. He's better. He's bigger. He is mightier. I promise you it's worth it. These people realized this is a different thing. This is not like anything else. Number five on your handout, if you're taking notes. Until it faced, they're totally changed by, by Jesus until it faced hateful persecution. Hateful persecution. Verse 23, about that time, there rose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, little copies of that temple we saw earlier, He brought in no little business for the craftsmen. In other words, he brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen. That little temple that we saw earlier, the big temple, huge one, they would make little little copies of it so you could take a little piece of Artemis home with you. You know, you get, it's the gift shop outside the big tourist attraction. And you get to take a little one and you can add it to all your other collections of gods and goddesses. And so Demetrius is, he's making these things, he's making his livelihood, he's making big money off of it. And all of a sudden, People are coming into Ephesus and they are coming and they're hearing what's going on and, and, and somebody says, yeah, did you hear about this guy down here who's preaching about some guy that came, he says God came here and his name was Jesus and he, he lived and he died for our sins and we have to repent and follow him and, and he, he rose again on the third day. and oh, That sounds interesting. I never heard that before. I'm not doing anything tonight. Uh, let's go down and check it out. They go down, they check it out, they get saved, and they don't buy a silver shrine of Artemis when they leave because they realize it's Jesus or nothing. It's not Jesus plus the other gods of this world. And it's killing Demetrius' business. By the way, let me just say, people who profit from wickedness will always resist you changing. Always. Always. And I don't care whether it's the guy who sells your dealer. I don't care whether it's a friend that you used to go out and hang out with and your buddies. And I don't care whether it's family and they feel, they feel like somehow it's going to mess them up. I don't care if it's your boss or if it's a, it's a, a, a pornographer. They're, whatever it is, they are going to resist you making a change. I promise you, you follow Jesus, they're going to, they're going to resist, they're going to fight it. Look at this, verse 25. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades. And he said, men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you can see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and practically in the whole province of Asia. And he says that man-made gods are no gods at all. Imagine the nerve of this guy. He's telling them that God made us instead of we making God, right? Let me stop and say this. Did you know that most people, most people in our city worship things, not God? They worship things, not Jesus. Did you know that? You say, well, I, I mean, I don't worship things. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You love, you love things 
You give them, they make you happy, they bless you, you give them your time and your money and your praise and your energy and your thoughts, you think about them and you mull them over, and it's, you know, people worship all kinds of things. They worship uh, a, a movie star, and they give their praise in this, and, they're, and they put them up posters of them, and they, they, they think about them, and they buy magazines that have articles specifically about them, and the paparazzi take pictures of them, and, and, or they worship a a sports figure, or they worship a sports team, or they give, and that's all they can talk about. You know, all they can praise, all that makes them happy. If the team loses, they're bummed. If the team won, wins the championship, they party all day and all night with weird painted faces. You know, it, this is, you say, is that worship? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's idolatry. It's replacing the God who gives us blessing and the God who makes us happy and the Jesus who changes our life and the Jesus who's worth praising and worth talking about and worth singing about and replaces it with drugs or alcohol or sex or sports teams or cars or jobs or money or relationships or anything, any number of other things, children or parents or cars or houses or land, a thousand different things it could be. People, most people worship in, in your city right now They worship things, not God, not Jesus. Verse 27, he says this, There is danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who is worshipped through the whole province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. And this guy must have been a great speaker because about this time he is inspiring the crowd. They are furious and they begin shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon the whole city is in an uproar. It's like the union thugs got together here. You know, like the, the local silversmiths, you know, 100 gets together and they, they start hollering and yelling and raising a ruckus and pretty soon uh, the whole city is in an uproar. And people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Now, uh, when I was telling my wife this story, she said, theater, is that, I said, she said, in my mind, I see like uh, just a, a regular theater, you know, like with stage curtains and theater seating. Well, let me tell you, this is not just a little theater. This is a huge, huge thing. Let me show you a picture of what it looks like. There you go. This place would seat like 24,000 people. It still exists to this day. And so all of a sudden, the whole city gets in an uproar, and they rush into this place. And they go dashing in, and all of a sudden, they're, you know, there's a huge uproar. And people, people are, basically have a herd mentality. I'm sure you've noticed this, but... If you, everybody went outside, if we all went outside right now out in the parking lot and looked up, uh, pretty soon somebody driving by would be looking out their window or somebody across the street would be coming out and looking up too, trying to figure out what was going on because this is the way people work. And so people are like, hey, look, a crowd screaming and shouting. Beat's going to work. Let's go see what's going on. And the whole city comes together. And I love this. Look at verse 30. Paul, I love this guy. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. They, Paul's like, hey, look, 24,000 people. Someone should preach. I mean, somebody got to tell these people about Jesus. Look at this. Look at this big crowd. And they're like, no. No, you're not. No, absolutely not. You cannot go out and pick a fight with 24,000 angry iron workers. You just don't do that. So the Jews, uh, I'm not going to take the time to read through the rest of the Scripture. It's on your handout. But, but they 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 try to get all, all the, the crowd calmed down. Finally, there is a man that for like two hours they chant, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And finally the town clerk, one of the town officials, he comes up and he, he quiets the crowd down and he says, listen, everybody knows that our goddess is great. Okay? I mean, we're not, nobody here is arguing with you about this. And, and everybody knows that that these guys, they have a, if they've got a bone to pick, there's courts. They can take them to court. And we are in danger of being charged with rioting. If the Roman government hears about this, there's really going to be problems, especially for those of us in leadership. They're going to come here. Uh, a few heads are going to roll. You don't want this to happen. So get out of here. Okay? Just go to your homes and, and disband. And then it says down at the end of the chapter, 
in verse 41, in Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 1, after the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. So Paul has been in Ephesus for like two years at this point. And he's done so much damage to evil that people are getting angry. Let me stop and say this. Can you imagine the, the uproar it would cause if in your town, if in your town, somebody started bringing together the cocaine and the marijuana and the meth, somebody started bringing together the, the, the porn and the, the collections of, of evil things and they started bringing their gang paraphernalia and they started bringing everything in their life that was a tie back to the old life and they brought it together and they burned four or five million bucks worth of it out here in the parking lot. Think that would make a, a, a buzz in the town? Oh yeah. Think that would make the news? Oh yes. I, I Personally, I think I know a few people who'd want to come by and inhale the smoke, but that's a different story. That's a totally different story. It, it would make big news. God was moving so powerfully so mightily in these people's lives that it was worth turning away from evil and turning toward Jesus. And this is the way in which Colossians comes to pass. Paul moves on some years later after Epaphras has gone down and preached and planted this church in the little town of Colossae. Some things are going on there. There's some big city slickers that have moved in to the town and they're starting to preach and teach some really weird things. And he comes out and and visits Paul, who by this time is in jail in Rome, imprisoned for the gospel that he's preaching. And he goes and he visits them, and he's like, man, these good people, they're great people, they believe in Jesus, but could you write a letter back to them and and keep them focused? Because they're they're going back to this thing of saying, Jesus plus this equals my salvation. Jesus plus salvation my spirituality, Jesus plus these other beings, these other angels, these other spirits. Can you correct that? And so we're going to see that Paul, in this letter, there is one thing he's all about. There's one thing he's about. And I want to see you make this your thing that you're about. That is this. The point of this whole message and this whole series, if you walk away with nothing else, you've got to get this. Jesus is greater. Jesus is is greater. He is bigger. He is better. He is more glorious. He is more awesome. He is more worthy of praise. He is more satisfying and joy-giving than anything else you have ever seen or ever done or ever tried. He is more powerful than the chains that bind you. He is more powerful than the weight you feel like you've got strapped around your ankle as you try to leave the old life behind. He is bigger and stronger than that. He is more satisfying than the thing that you subtly wish you might not have to turn away from to follow Him wholeheartedly. Jesus is worth it. He is greater and He is better than anything else. See, you're you're looking at a guy who knows it's true because I can promise you this. You're not looking at somebody who never tried anything else. I will tell you the truth. I have found in my struggle, you're looking at a guy that came out of pornography addiction, you're looking at a guy who has struggled through and and fought through, and what I have found is this, Jesus is greater. In my life, Jesus is greater. In your life, He is able to be greater. He is more satisfying. He puts the broken pieces of your life back together. He lifts you up when you have fallen. He is patient and kind and loving and gracious and forgiving. Jesus is greater. Won't you turn wholeheartedly from your sin today? Won't you turn wholeheartedly away from evil today and turn wholeheartedly to Jesus because He is greater? Let's bow our heads together for prayer.